Hello, good morning everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today at the second of our Ask the Breeder series. Today we'll be talking about all things wheat breeding. Um, uh, I'm Will Charlton, Arable Marketing Manager for Lee McGrain in the UK. Um, and I'm also joined with my colleague Ed Flatman, uh, who's head of uh, European Head of Wheat Research for Lee McGrain. Um, just before we start, um, a couple of uh, minor admin points. So firstly, um, uh, we do have a basis point available for, for this meeting today. Um, uh, in order to claim your basis points, if you could please, in the chat function, in the question function, send us your name, your basis number and your postcode, and that'll be enough uh, for us to, to, to claim the point for your, um, you joining us. Um, also, just to let you know that we have a couple of polls um, uh, which we'll publish, uh, which um, uh, we'd love for you to fill in as we go through, uh, and we'll let you know the results of those um, as we go through uh, this morning's session. The format for this morning, um, over the next 45 minutes, so after a, um, a very brief introduction from Ed and I, um, uh, we will um, uh, then open up the floor to questions. We have a few pre-submitted questions from, from yourselves. Uh, but also, please do encourage you to, to ask questions as we go. Uh, we may not be able to answer everybody's questions um, in, in the time available, but um, hopefully we can answer um, uh, uh, quite a few or, or most of the questions today. OK, brilliant. So if I could have the next slide, please. So introducing you here to my colleague, Ed. So Ed, as I said, is the head of wheat research for, for Lima Grain Europe. Um, Ed grew up on a family farm in North Suffolk, um, has had 30 years experience in, in cereals breeding um, and yeah, leads the European wheat breeding program for, for Lima Grain. So good morning, Ed. Thanks for joining us. Morning, all. Pleased to be here. <laughs> Ed, so I'll, I'll let you take it from here and briefly introduce the um, uh, aims and objectives and some of the history of the, the Lima Grain wheat breeding program. Excellent. That's great. Thanks, Will. So. What I'd like to do is um, just give you a sort of outline of uh, the program, where it's come from, uh, talk a little bit about where we are now, and then start thinking about where we're going in the future. And hopefully that'll lead on to some, some interesting questions around wheat, wheat breeding, and, and the opportunities we have. Um, the program itself has it's got a long history. Um, in terms of some of the landmark varieties, we've had old favorites like Claire and French variety of Pache, both of which still growing today, nearly 20 years later. Um, at the time they were launched, block bruster varieties, breakthroughs in terms of yield, quality, disease resistance. Since then, uh, we've had changes in market, we've had changes in market pressure. Um, we've had the advent of midge resistant wheat, <clears throat> which in, in France was a, a quality wheat called Altigo in the early 2000s. Um, we've continued to develop the theme around soft wheat, particularly. Um, Varieties like Zulu and Archeos being uh, industry leading uh, standards again across Europe. Bread wheats, we've had varieties before like Solstice and now uh, into the market Crusoe, hitting the top quality in terms of end users, but also really looking at some of the other characteristics, particularly things like high protein, clearly important for the grower to achieve the premium. So, really starting to understand more about the background genetics of the varieties we're releasing. I think really good in, insight into that is the Septoria story. Uh, clearly, in the last few years, major pressure in terms of control of the disease. We, we could see some of the chemistry was going to be withdrawn from the market and some of the efficacy was declining. But in terms of breeding, this has been a story we've been working on for 20, 30 years. And varieties like Claire, Alchemy, and then today varieties like Sundance and Absalom. I think the difference here is that we're now getting a greater insight into the genetics. The varieties like Sundance, we know we've put four or five different genes together, building levels of resistance, and looking to really build more robustness into the package we can produce. At the same time, not forgetting overall productivity, so high yield clearly a driver, with new releases like Skyscraper, which is sitting at the top of the current list, and also a companion variety Spotlight, I think the interest with Spotlight, as well as the yield, is really grain quality. Um, soft wheats traditionally have been tended to have weaknesses for uh, sprouting, lower hackbergs, essentially lower bushel weight. Spotlight butts the trend. We've got variety there that's got high hackberg. Uh, we've got good sprouting resistance. We've got good bushel weight. Um, 
and we know some of the genetics behind that so we can breathe those into the generations coming forward. So I think that's just a bit of a history, a bit of a timeline. So I think we move to the next slide. So looking at where we are today. So clearly within the program, we need to be looking at the major quality markets. Clearly growers are, are now tending to grow more for, for the market rather than just out and out yield. And again, across Europe, we can take advantage of the fact that we've got programs in France, Germany, and the Czech Republic. We're producing high quality wheats, which we can, uh, we can look at there in terms of e-quality, some of which we can now develop in, in the UK for domestic use. Uh, we've got the mainstay of the bread making market, varieties like Crusoe and also Detroit, which is just coming to the, to the group two. Uh, we've got the favourites in terms of biscuit makings, like varieties like Claire and Zulu that really sort of set the standard. And then other markets like distilling, where we've got a, a long history of soft wheats that have uh, met the requirement for, for whiskey production. In terms of biotic stress, so pests, diseases that, are, that attack wheat, there's a long list. And potentially getting longer. Um, varieties today, particularly in the feed sector, a lot of our portfolio has got mid resistance, uh, which has been around for around 20 years. We're getting those into the quality streams with varieties like Detroit. Clearly foliar disease, very topical. Uh, Septoria, a lot of pressure from disease, a lot of pressure from rust, particularly yellow rust this season. Um, and again, varieties like Sundance coming in with this multigenic resistance, looking to build more robustness into the to the genetics. Ear disease, I don't think we can forget that. Uh, clearly more of an issue on the continent, particularly where maize is in the rotation. But again, maize is increasing here, high rainfall patterns around flowering, it's potentially a risk. So again, something that we need to be looking forward to. Biotic stress, these are all the other things that are thrown at the wheat crop. So extremes in temperature, water availability, um, whether that's winter kill, late spring frosts, but I think really what we're looking at here is, is robustness, it's resilience, it's, it's the ability of varieties to, to buffer whatever's thrown at them. I think going forward, that's probably going to be one of the important characteristics we, we want to draw out of the, the new varieties. And then just a, a slight aside in terms of niche markets. Um, in France, we've got an integrated chain from, from breeder through to, uh, to end user in terms of uh, bakery products. Um, so looking at high amylose, high fiber, so health benefits. Um, high protein wheat for Jackie Brossard, the bakery company, um, and also lima grain cereal ingredients, looking at things like waxy wheat, so other products that we can provide for, for certain end markets. So that's just a snapshot of where the, where the program is and some of the, the threads we've got going forward. So just moving on to the, the next slide, that's really looking to the, to the next decade or so. Breeding still is a sort of eight to 10 year process, so process we make this year will be landing on farm in that sort of time period. So we really need to have a clear side of what our objectives are, uh, both for growers and also end users. Um, a lot of this is around not just increasing productivity, but really consistency. So consistency of yield, consistency of quality, ease of production, um, resilience in its broader sense, how varieties can tolerate what's thrown at them, but also looking at what's happening within weather patterns. Clearly, flexibility of sowing window is becoming more important. And also what we want to do is really to provide high quality variety advice to give farmers a good insight into the new varieties as they come to the market. For the end users, it's very similar. similar. Uh, they're looking for reliable quality, consistency of supply, ease of processing, um, and then they have constraints around food safety, uh, nutritional value, economically, sustainably sourcing the raw products. So all of those elements we, could, we, can, uh, we can help with in terms of breeding and genetics. So just moving on to the sort of external factors, all the things outside our control that affect uh, the way the wheat crop's grown. Um, three sort of main areas here. The technology one, very interesting in terms of rapid developments in all sorts of areas. Um, in breeding, a lot of it's around automation. Um, increasing precision of what we're doing, um, and some very powerful developments in genetic analysis, understanding the genes behind the, the traits we're looking at in the field. On-farm technology, whether it's precision agriculture, uh, developments in machinery, decision support, IPM, all of those different changes in the way that the crop's grown, um, 
and different ways that varieties are used and how we can see traits in some of the varieties that we bring to market that can fit with those systems better. Same for end users, uh, changes in customer demand, uh, whether it's in terms of nutritional content or just trends. Again, we've got material in our breeding pipeline that will suit these needs going forward, some of which may not have clearly been defined today. Legislation affects this in a number of different ways. Um, clearly from the breeding side, we've got live issues around things like gene editing, uh, which at the moment we can use as proof of concept, but not as a, as a way of deriving a product. In terms of agriculture, clearly restrictions on, on pesticide use, uh, potentially inputs from nitrogen. And in terms of end products, additives, residues, all of these are things that we, we can potentially have a genetic solution for, or at least work together with partners to find complementary technologies that work in a constructive way. And then probably the big unknown, the environment. Uh, climate change in its, in its various forms, um, whether it's trends in terms of mild winters, hotter summers, or just simply the fact we're seeing more erratic and extreme weather patterns. Um, it has a big effect, big effect on the way the crop grows, big effect on disease patterns, disease severity, um, and also the availability and uptake of key nutrients. And again, different varieties have different ways of responding to that. And we can tease out some of the key traits that can help to, to mitigate some of these effects. So in terms of the process, um, the breeding timeline, clearly speed is important. We want to drive products quickly to the market, but that's not everything. Um, we still need to test the, the new varieties in the field and to ensure we're delivering a reliable product. So one of the things that's been driving us has clearly been the technology side, um, not just on things we can do in the field, including use of drones and other ways of measuring the crop, but largely on the genetic side, um, taking advantage of some of the tools that have been available in animal breeding for some time. So we're not just looking for individual markers, that we can identify single traits, so things like midge resistance or the hard or soft milling. What we can do now is use many tens of thousands of markers and do really complex genetic analysis and use very complex computational tools um, to do something called genomic selection. And for any of you familiar with animal breeding, this has been around for a long time and now it's available in crop plants. And the exciting thing for us is we can take a single grain, a single plant, and from that, extract the DNA, get a prediction of the potential it has for yield quality or a whole manner of different traits. So if we can identify that sooner, then we can more rapidly develop that particular line. In terms of traits, I mean, there's clearly a, a long list on the, on the current list, but I think going forward, that's going to expand. Um, we've already seen the importance now of things like BYDV, but there's many other insect pests, changes in diseases, uh, potentially changes in nutritional content of wheat. Um, so quite a lot of opportunities for us going forward. And uh, hopefully around this, there'll be some interesting questions about things that people are thinking about now, where they want the crop to go in terms of either opportunities or things we need to try and compensate for as the environment, legislation, technology changes. So hopefully that's the sort of scene setting and uh, look forward to some question, interesting questions. Ed. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, just before we start, so I've uh, we've published a couple of polls whilst you were talking. So the first one we asked the audience, um, what is the, the most important characteristic you look for when choosing a new wheat variety? Actually um, split um, fairly evenly, but the most important three um, from our audience this morning, uh, gross output at 26%. Um, uh, disease and pest resistance at 26%, they're both tied neck and neck. Um, and then um, uh, we have uh, consistency and performance as third at 21% and then followed by end market potential at, at 15%. So uh, I guess perhaps uh, a, a, a variety there, but may, maybe no, no surprises that it's, it's split fairly evenly. Ed, any comments? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's an interesting split. I mean, clearly, Driving productivity is, is still a key objective. Um, I mean, there's, there's an interesting debate to be had around uh, the genetic improvement of varieties over the last decade or two. I mean, year on year, we're still seeing an increase of roughly half a percent in yield um, on the recommended list. Whether we see that on farm, 
that's that's an open question. Um, and it's more about managing some of these factors that, that restrict yield and whether it's disease resistance or whether it's resilience, whether it's trait um, resistance to stress. So, uh, yeah, interesting split. Up. Fantastic. We then asked, um, how has that changed in the last 10 years? Um, uh, so if you think back to when you were making those crosses back in 2010, um, how, how the variety selection has changed. So um, overwhelmingly, um, number one here, 38.5% is looking to reduce risk um, and, and variable costs um, uh, there, then followed by um, more consistent performance on farm at 23%. Uh, and then split uh, both on 15.4%, you have increased focus on overall yield and um, now growing for more premium markets. Um, only 7% said it hasn't really changed. Um, so yeah, uh, quite a, um, it probably echoes your, your comments there, Ed, about uh, the looking to mitigate risk and, and, and look at more on farm performance. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, th I think one of the things is it's around the question of disease resistance that I think we see that as, as, as almost all part of the insurance package, that if we can build that in alongside uh, the, the chemistry that's available, um, and different, different growers will use resistance in a different way. Um, those who've got large areas to cover, limited number of spray days, you prioritize varieties. Um, and also just on, on farm logistics, if you've got the, uh, dispersed parcels of land, those that are more remote, perhaps you put your more secure varieties. So, it's a question of tailoring the variety to fit your particular situation. I think we see that more now that, that people are using more, uh, perhaps to be more precise in the way they, they choose the varieties to fit their, their setup. Brilliant. Um, Ed, we'll now go to our first question um, uh, from Robert D. And he asks, what new traits in winter wheat varieties can we expect to see in the next 10 years? BYDV and you know, orange wheat blossom resistance now, um, uh, slug resistance soon? Question mark. Yeah, well, I think this this is the interesting thing. There's a question. There's a wide cross section there. I mean, insect pests generally um, becoming more prevalent. Um, so aphids, not just transmission of virus, but also aphid feeding as well. Um, I mean, as well as the BYDV across Europe, we're seeing another virus as a weak dwarf virus. Um, not aphid spread, spread by a leaf hopper. Um, again, we've got leads on uh, resistance for that. Um, the orange blossom midge, it's, it does tend to go in and out of um, by season, um, as different conditions pr promote it. Um, but a lot of varieties now have it, and it's, it's a single gene, uh, which we're, we're developing into all the quality streams. Um, I think alongside that, we're seeing the, the yellow midge, so a sort of cousin of the orange version. Um, we've got some leads there in terms of potential resistance or varieties that are more tolerant. Um, so I think a lot of things we're developing in those kind of areas. Slug resistance, probably at the moment, more difficult. Um, I think we're seeing some genetic variation between varieties, um, but perhaps having to look further afield than the sort of elite wheat pool to find resistance. So that is definitely something that, that we're looking towards. Um, and I think generally in terms of resistance that Again, it's due to climate change. Um, we've seen a big, big change in the, the yellow rust population over the last decade or so. If things change, we may see other diseases come in. Um, occasionally, there's reports of things like tan spot, um, but generally at low levels. Um, things like saddle gall midge, again, tend to be localized, a few reports. But all these things, they're, they're kind of things that we're working on in the background and potentially quite quickly can move into the, the sort of elite stream of varieties that get produced as and when things change. But I think, yeah, a number of different opportunities we've got coming through the pipeline over over the next decade or so. Fantastic. Um, next, I have a question from Alistair M. Um, you kind of touched on it there, very um, pertinent given the pressure we've had this year. We've had a problem controlling yellow rust this year on varieties with good resistance scores. Is it possible to have more accurate disease resistance information from breeders regarding varieties? as they know the genetic resistance and have seen varieties perform in disease nurseries before becoming commercially available? Yeah, this is a, a very large question. I mean, what we've seen over the last decade or so uh, with the advent of what was termed the warrior race, but now we know it's a, a sort of soup of races that's, that's coming from, from, from Asia into Europe. Um, it's changed dramatically the, the disease. Um, it's, it's more aggressive. 
it potentially occurs earlier at high temperatures um, and affects a wider range of varieties. So I think what we're seeing now within our, our selection is that we're, we've always needed to maintain diversity of resistance, and that's one of the key threads of the program. Um, also building up layers of resistance. So we know for, for a lot of the commercial varieties, we've got combinations of uh, multiple genes that are working together. Um, what we have seen is a, is a decline in the level of uh, seedling resistance, particularly. So that early stage resistance as, as the plant develops um, before the adult plant resistance kicks in around ear emergence. Um, and we do actually have quite a lot of foresight on this. Um, we take advantage of the fact that because we walk, operate across um, a wide range of sites, not just across the UK, but across Europe, where these races are um, freely, freely mixing, um, we have a good, robust screen of varieties well in advance of them entering the, the official system. Um, I think what that helps us with is both surveillance. We can see how rust races are moving around. Um, we can test different combinations as they're coming towards market. Um, the challenge still is that the races will develop very quickly. Um, we're not in the situation we had maybe 10, 20 years ago where the evolution of the rust race was, was effectively linear. You move from last year's race to this next year's race and it, that new race became dominant. Now we've got many, many different races that are all freely mixing out there. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a very movable feast. And I think what we're trying to do is gain a good insight into the resistance, um, how robust it is. Um, durability is always a very difficult question to gauge, but we do know that some of the resistance genes we're working with um, have different modes of action. So a bit like uh, chemistry, um, you put different modes of action together and you make it more difficult for the, the pathogen to overcome the resistance. So we're very keen to, to share that information where we have on varieties coming through um, to talk in more detail about what we've seen, um, about the ways that you can try and manage that variety in terms of its, its resistance. Um, so not just those that are more susceptible that need a more robust fungicide protocol, but those that have better resistance and, and what measures you need to take to try and preserve the resistance. So it's, it's a bit like trying to preserve um, chemistry. You need to take appropriate um, uh, strategies to, to work with the, the resistance and to um, to get the best out of your variety. So so yeah, we're, we're quite open to discussing that and, and talking about what we know about the, the different varieties as they come through to the market. Fantastic. Thanks, so we now have a question from Philip M. Uh, and it's, as more breeders produce varieties with orange wheat blossom meat resistance, will it reduce the overall threat and allow varieties without orange wheat blossom meat resistance to be safely grown? That's, that's an interesting question. Um, so, it, so in Canada, there's been a release of um, meat resistant varieties over a period of time. And um, because it's grown on a very large scale, the, the, the insistence is a legal requirement that the, the variety released has to have 10% of a susceptible variety in that in that mix. And uh, it's, it's known as a refuge. So you have some of the susceptible plants there that the, the midge can, can feed on. I think in the UK, because of the, the mixed cropping, because of the field sizes, we've got other, other grass species, the pressure is perhaps not so high. Um, Clearly, I think if we do control the, the orange midge, we might have a, a different problem, which is it might open the door for, for, for the yellow midge, the, the, uh, the sister species. Um, and I think that's a bit like we've seen with, with other um, more particular diseases. Sharp eye spot was a problem some while ago. We now more tend to see more eye spot, uh, Septoria nodorum, and then it's now more Septoria triticide. So, there's always competing species that will come in if there's an opportunity. Um, but I don't think particularly having a, a wider area down to resistant varieties will make the, the others more susceptible. Um, and I think one of the main drivers is, is the seasonality. Uh, you need those key conditions around May time, uh, moist, warm soils for the, the larvae to emerge and, and the, the, the midge to fly. So. Probably not such an issue in terms of spread to susceptible varieties, but perhaps more so a question of what 
happens with other species. Fantastic. Now, Ed, um, going on to um, kind of end markets, we've got a question from Robert W. Uh, do you think that farmers should be aiming for specific markets or just barn fillers? Well, I think we've probably seen that in, in the answer to one of the earlier um, poll questions. Um, I think I think growers are being more targeted in, in terms of specific markets. Um, there's a lot of good varieties out there um, for each of the particular end uses. And I think it's a, it's a question of looking at your own situation. Um, clearly for bread wheats, uh, hitting the spec in terms of protein. Uh, so varieties like Crusoe that give you a, a genetic advantage to hit that. Um, in terms of biscuit wheats, again, it's, it's about soundness of grain, um, as well as the actual sort of re rheological properties to, to meet the needs of the end user. Um, so I think where farmers have got an opportunity, um, I think particularly in some of the markets where They've got flexibility. So around soft wheats, particularly, you've got a number of markets, depending where you are in the country, uh, whether it's for, for human consumption, whether it's for export, whether it's for distilling, growing those varieties with a, with a good chance of hitting those, those kind, of, kind of markets, hitting those premiums, is, is definitely, definitely a target. Other areas, depending on soil type, depending on rotation, yield may be the key driver and then other factors come into play. So it's a lot of it's around security and ease of production. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, it's a mix between the two. And I think with what we're trying to do, trying to fulfill both of those two needs. So look at markets, see how growers can achieve those premiums. But on the other side, look at this overall question of productivity and how we can, how we can keep driving that forward. Link, link to that, Ed, uh, I've got a question from another Robert, Robert D. Um, the UK still imports quality high protein milling wheat. Can you breed one for the UK that will fill this market? That's that's an interesting question. I mean, the UK has has been pretty well self sufficient in, in bread wheat for a long time, and I think that's a move that's happened over the last fifty or so years. Not all of the wheat we grow in the UK can fill all of the needs, and I think one of the keys there is is high protein as well as protein quality. Um, one of the magic ingredients you need for high protein is sunshine, which we don't always get. Um, so it's not just about managing N rates and having varieties that have a good conversion rate of, of um, applied N into protein. Um, sometimes it is about the, the, the availability of varieties from other, other continents in that case that can fill that need. Um, we have seen, however, that we've got uh, varieties coming from the near continent, particularly things like Germany wheats, um, and we've got some of those within our program, and we're looking to see whether we can adapt those and grow those within the UK, and to see whether the variety d delivers what, what we need it to for the, for the UK end users. I think on that, we have seen varieties grown here over different periods of time that haven't quite delivered in terms of their, uh, their either protein level or protein quality. And again, it's about security. That I think often with these high protein wheats, there's, there's a yield penalty. Um, yield and, and protein are working in opposition. And so if you fail to hit the spec in terms of the protein, you end up with a relatively low yielding wheat crop, which the value, value can, uh, can diminish. So it is a challenge. Um, I think in terms of what we're doing now, we're, we're working particularly within the sort of German E group, uh, rather than trying to replicate a, a Canadian um, hard red winter type. Um, but it's definitely something that's that we've we've got in the pipeline, and we're, we're working with end users and seeing what opportunities we can we can develop. Brilliant. Moving back on, on to more breeding in more general, Ed got a question from Pat H. Will hybrid wheat make a difference in the future? There's comments around um, increasingly seeing double cropping around the world and catch crops being introduced back into the UK. Um, yeah, but main question, will hybrid wheat make a difference in the future? I, I, I think hybrid wheat does, does have potential. I think not, not just in terms of, of driving yields, but I think some of the other characteristics that the hybrids bring forward. Um, so in a similar way to, to hybrid barley, um, hybrids generally are, are more vigorous. Um, Clearly, rooting is, is very important for, for a number of situations, not just second weeks, but also stress conditions. 
and also different difficult seabed conditions as, as we've seen over the last season. Um, so I think in terms of opportunities, hybrids do give us something different to the, the conventional varieties. Um, so perhaps slightly different to the story we've we heard previously in terms of all seed rate. Um, but I think with, with hybrid wheat, as we go forward, we can we can look to something that, that offers us something different to what we're able to provide currently with our with our conventional varieties. Excellent. Probably linked to that, um, uh, casting our net a bit further afield. When will we have wheat, a wheat plant, which will fix nitrogen in the soil? Very interesting question. Um, so this this is a question that's been going around for for a long time. I mean, legumes have, have evolved over time to, to naturally fix uh, nitrogen. Um, it, it's a symbiotic relationship with the bacteria in the soil, and it's it, genetically it's very complicated. Many many tens of genes, both on the on the the crop side and also on the on the bacteria side to make that happen. Um, but I mean, there's, there's some very exciting work happening, happening in Norwich at the John Innes Centre where they're starting to put together the, the components of this. Um, and it's something potentially that we can, we can look forward to. Um, in terms of a product at the moment, it's limited by regulation um, because of the methods used to, to do this. Um, but potentially, rather than relying on applied N, it's something that the wheat crop would clearly, clearly um, take advantage of. So, so yeah, technically big challenge, but uh, but yes, the, the tools and techniques are becoming available to to put those components together. Excellent. Um, uh, moving now a bit more into um, uh, kind of placing varieties and and in certain situations, um, there's a question around um, where continuous wheat is grown. Um, what characteristics are you looking for? This is from Stuart P. Is, uh, question is, is science skyscraper suitable for where continuous wheat is being grown? If there's a need for an aggressive variety that is quick out of the blocks. Maybe as a general comment as well, Ed, around kind of breeding varieties for certain kind of um, situations on rotational situations on farm as well might, might be good. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, se second wheat, continuous wheat is... I mean, it's interesting from, from the breeding perspective because it, it's probably one of the tougher situations that you, we're going to test varieties under. Um, and I think what we've generally seen you know, over, over the last decades is, is the more consistent varieties tend to be those that are the good second wheats. Um, I mean, second wheat, it, it's not just all about take all and, and ice spot resistance. Um, a lot of it is down to what happens under the soil surface. Um, Clearly, rooting ability is key in this. Um, we don't actually have take all resistance as such. But clearly, we see varieties that are better in that second continuous wheat situation. So, so something like skyscraper would be ideally suited for that. Um, good establishment, uh, good early vigor gets established uh, under some, some difficult conditions. So, I think whatever ever point you're in your continuous wheat cycle in terms of the take all decline. Something like skyscraper would fit particularly well, um, and I think going forward, it's the kind of thing where we're starting to investigate more what is happening under the soil, um, looking at varieties and their rooting ability, um, not just for, for moisture and nutrient uptake, but also generally in terms of establishment, general levels of stress resistance. Um, and there's some really quite nice research work going on in various places looking at this, and we've got skyscraper and a number of varieties under test, and it's not always the shortest varieties have short roots. It's different varieties have different rooting profiles. And I think it's a question of making sure we get things like seed rate right, because um, we see tillering. We adjust seed rates due to tillering ability. Perhaps in the future, we'll be adjusting seed rates due to, to rooting ability and, and, and root spread to make sure we optimize that for different, different varieties. Brilliant. Linked to some of those comments you made at the end there, I've got a question from Olivia C. Um, probably very pertinent given the, the year we've had um, weather-wise. Uh, with climate change, you know, dry springs, wet summers, um, what are you breeding to meet those conditions? So I think this, this is where some of the tools that we have available to us now are changing. Um, I mean, over, over the course of time, breeders have tended to have longer breeding cycle, selecting varieties over a period of years, 
then you will have wet, wet years, dry years, and the varieties that come to the top will have survived all of those. Because we're trying to accelerate the breeding, perhaps we have less seasons in the field. Um, but what we're using is we're using computer modeling, um, we're using uh, soil type information, we use it using uh, meteorological information, looking at weather patterns, weather trends, and then overlaying that with our, our, our trial locations and seeing how varieties interact with those conditions. Um, and at a genetic level, seeing how different genes interact. So I think, again, it gets back to this idea that we, we're not specifically breeding for, for drought resistance or waterlogged tolerance per se. What we're really looking for is, is varieties that are, that are flexible. They can, they can buffer whatever stresses are thrown at them, whatever point that is through the growing cycle. Um, and I think you just need to look at some of, the, some of the more consistent varieties that we've seen in the last decade. That you'll find that they're not, they're not the, the most rapidly developing or the highest tillering, or even the earliest or the latest. They, they sit somewhere in that middle ground and whatever season develops, they can just tolerate that stress. And if it's a dry spring, um, problems around nitrogen uptake, N can sit on the surface for two or three weeks without being washed in. Other seasons, it's too wet. And again, the N doesn't get applied at the right time. Um, wet summers, harvest security, again, a bit like earlier, we were talking about spotlight in, in terms of sprouting resistance. Some of these components we can put together quite precisely now and factor into the varieties to build in this robustness. Um, so it's really sort of a composite approach. It's really looking at, at the trends, what we can identify in terms of varieties that can buffer these stresses, um, but then looking at specific factors like the sprouting resistance um, and potentially like rooting ability, some of these, these key traits that we can select for more, more precisely. Great. Um, we've published another couple of polls over the last five or ten minutes, Ed. Um, so I thought it'd be a good opportunity uh, with five minutes to go just to um, run through those. So the first um, one of the two we asked were, what do you think will be the biggest change in how you grow wheat in ten years' time? Um, so uh, the overwhelming uh, number one with 47.8% was the loss of plant protection products. Um, uh, you know, there's probably been a couple of big ones that we've relied on for a number of years left the market within the last 12 months in, in terms of deter and chlorothalonil. Um, so yeah, very, very pertinent there. Um, then uh, at 26.1%, greater climate variability. So I guess exactly what um, we've just been talking about. Um, uh, then 21.7% is reduction in fertilizer inputs. Um, and then um, uh, following behind at 4.3% is growing for new or emerging end markets. Um, any any comments on that? Is it as you'd expected? Any surprises? I think so. Pretty much as I'd expect. I think the the interesting one around the uh, the nitrogen application is clearly nitrogen use efficiency, um, a key driver in in all the main crop species. Uh, trying to get more more production with less N applied. Um, I mean, the, the other one in terms of end use. I mean, at the moment we're looking at protein uh, increasing protein content um, to to meet specifications. Um, but at the same time, we, we do know that some varieties actually bake bread at, or bake good bread at lower protein contents and trying to understand some of the genetics behind that. So potentially looking at um, protein quality as much as protein content. And then there's not such a high demand for um, achieving that 13% um, requirement. So I think some of this is, is working together across the industry to understand what the opportunities are. Um, some of these will be in terms of processing. Some of these will be in terms of genetics. And again, it's this sort of complementary technology approach that if we have foresight of what's coming forward, we can see within our breeding programs what variation we've got available and then try and target some of these particular opportunities. Um, and again, it's, it's the same on the, on the, on the AdChem side. I mean, there it, it has been a question of, of trying to predict, second guess, look to see what which chemistry is more likely to be withdrawn. Um, so the, the loss of CTL, not a surprise, but again, it was something that we needed to see well in advance to, to work on the breeding cycle to supplement that with resistance to, to fill the gap. So, so yeah, interest, interested in terms of the way people see those different priorities. Good. And then we then asked, um, what role will wheat breeding play in adapting to this change? 
Um, so no pressure, Ed, but um, uh, there's overwhelmingly that there's going to be a much more important part in breeding and in adapting to the change over the next 10 years. So 25% uh, said it would be the most important part. Um, and then 68.8% said more than it currently does. Um, only 6.3% said the same. Um, nobody said it would play less of a part than it than it already does. So it um, uh, uh, should keep you busy for, for some time to come. That's good to hear. Well, I, th I think this, this is the thing that we're, we're not looking to find all the solutions in terms of genetics. And, and it is understanding the either the gaps that genetics can fill or, or some of the opportunities and i think that's the interesting thing to to have conversations around and and whoever it is within the production system whether it's on the grower side in terms of agronomy in terms of end users in terms of customers what what things can people see that potentially breeding can help play a part in and i mean that's really what we're interested in going forward great um so a couple of minutes. Uh, I think perhaps one, sorry, for one very brief answer on a on a question. Um, uh, again, casting a bit out to the future, we have um, a question from CG, which is: How soon do you see small robots becoming an asset to your trials program? Well, I think this this is something that um, we're already starting to see the benefit from. Um, I mean, for for a lot of a lot of what breeders do, it's it's about making assessments in the field. Um, and there's already some very nice systems that we're starting to use and others that have been developed where we can get automated assessment for things like disease and other characteristics. Um, I mean, clearly, if you've, if you've got a, a human making those, those assessments for eight, 10, 10 hours a day, clearly fatigue, weather conditions, all those things come into play. And yeah, we, we're all human. It's the quality of the information we're collecting is, is not always as robust. If we can automate it, the quality of data improves, our assessments approve, and then that fills the, the pipeline in terms of research. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's already happening now, and uh, I think we can look over the next decade to, to see some really, really nice innovations, particularly in that field. Fantastic. All, all, all really exciting, really exciting um, uh, uh, place to be, and, and yeah, lots of work to do in the future. Um, okay, I think... Um, probably what we'll do there's still quite a few questions which um which we've got from the audience said and i think uh, to everyone listening uh, what we'll try and do is try our best for those that we haven't had a chance to to answer um uh, to get back to you in in some one form or another um uh all i'd say uh, just in wrapping up for myself is thank you ever so much for dialing in um uh just to remind you, if, if, if you do want the, the, the basis point which is available for this morning's session, um, uh, please do just on the question um, uh, function, send us your name, your basis number and your postcode uh, and, and we can get uh, that sent off to, to, to basis. Um, uh, and yeah, thank you very much again for, for joining us. Ed, thank you ever so much for your, for your expertise and, and sharing your knowledge and, and the work that, that you and your team are doing um, both in the UK and, and, and across Europe. Um, yeah, well, thanks very much for the questions. That's uh, been very interesting. Brilliant. Um, and then all to say to you all is um, uh, if for those of you that um, we did do one a couple of weeks ago around all rate breeding. So for those of you that weren't able to log on to that, that is available um, to, to rewatch um back and um in the um in in the late autumn early winter we're planning a further two sessions uh where we'll have our uh, barley breeder um to talk all things barley breeding and also we'll have our pulses breeder um uh, to cover to cover uh, peas and beans um uh, with you all so uh, i look forward to, to seeing you then and thanks ever so much again for for joining us this morning and for those of you that, that joined us a couple of weeks ago as well uh, it's been a really good couple of sessions uh, and I hope you've enjoyed it and found it informative. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody.